So thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Boyd. I lead the Azure AI team. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about some of the many things that we have got going on. Um, honestly, there's so many new announcements that we have. We're really rushing to cram them into this hour. Um, but you know, I really love the opening of that video where they say, AI isn't coming, it's here. Because a lot of what we're going to do today is we're going to talk to you with customers about the things that they're doing to use AI in their business and help really inspire you how can you use it in yours? What are the opportunities that you have? And how can we really take all of this forward? And we start with customers that we're working with. We've had so much just explosion of AI over the last several years. Um, and it's really every industry, every company, every vertical that you can think of, people are out doing things. Just to pick a couple of these examples, you know, ABB is using uh, AI in their workforce management. And so they have uh, cognitive services and, and they're using the bot platform to really help connect their mobile workers all around the planet much more efficiently. And they see a 20% increase in customer satisfaction as a result of that. Tal is the largest insurance provider in Australia. And they've been using Azure AI, to, Azure Machine Learning, to build uh, more models and to deploy them faster. And as a result of having these models, they're able to really look at many more insurance cases and review them to make sure they're making the right decisions. 40 times more cases they're able to get through. So these and many more customers are working with Azure and really you know, driving a lot of value through them. And so I want to spend some time talking about how do we think about AI, how do we think about these services that we build, and, and how, what are the principles that we use to sort of bring them together. And for Microsoft, it starts with breakthrough research. At Microsoft, we have a research department from, in Microsoft Research that's been around for 27 years, which is longer than many of our competitors have even been companies. And the research that they've done has been just nothing short of mind-blowing. Uh, spread all across the globe, we have research centers where we tap into the best minds anywhere we can find them. And we've been the first to human parity in a whole slew of AI categories across speech recognition, across machine translation, across the most recent one earlier this, this year, uh, the Stanford uh, you know, conversational Q&A test. And we were the only ones to be at human parity. We won that contest. And so we're really leading the way with this groundbreaking research of how you can use AI to just do incredible and amazing things. And then we take that and make that the foundation of the products that we go and build. And so we take that research and quickly instill it into the products that we have. And at Microsoft, we're really fortunate. We have a wide suite of internal customers, of these internal products that we can then use to really harden and prove out that this stuff really works at scale. If you look at Bing, Bing has millions of advertisers. And we make 280,000 recommendations to those advertisers on how they can improve their campaign on Bing ads. So should they improve their, their bids for a particular keyword? Should they add more keywords that they should search? And really help drive the value to them, help them connect with the customers they want more quickly. PowerPoint Designer is rescuing us from terrible PowerPoints one slide at a time by really making recommendations based on AI of these terrible bullet points that I probably put together uh, and translating them into really expressive slides that show what are they trying to say, what is a much more effective way to communicate this. And that's based on AI and learning what's the content that they're expressing and how are they trying to say it. Xbox is delivering personalized experiences to millions of users every single day, recommending what different things they should use. And so we use those you know, different foundations of how we can sort of explore this internally with Microsoft, and then we invest in other areas based on these principles. First and foremost, we want to make people productive. Regardless of the skill level of the tools that you're using, we are going to make you more productive on the things that you're doing. If you're a novice at AI, if you're an expert at AI, we have tools that are really going to accelerate your work so you can get more done faster. Second, we have a the long history and really the benefit of having worked with many companies, enterprises, thousands of them over the years. And we've learned what are enterprises looking for? What are the challenges that they have as they need to work at a particular scale or as they need to integrate with their existing frameworks and, and their legacy? And we've really learned how do you put that together to make that work for enterprises. And most importantly is trust. At Microsoft, we have the most stringent set of privacy controls that we operate under. Uh, really across the industry, and we have the broadest set of compliance uh, certifications of any of the cloud providers. And we know that customers really value 
that their data is their data. It's going to be used only in ways that they have told us that they want to use it for, and we're not going to use it for any other purposes other than that. That's a critically important po uh, point for us. And so we pull all this together into the service that we call Azure AI. And so really, as you developers are thinking through how can you bring solutions to market, there are three primary areas that we see solutions landing. First is in apps and agents, second is in knowledge mining, and third is in machine learning. And so I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, so why don't we start with apps and agents. So if you're a developer and you're trying to add AI into your app, the easiest way to do it is to start with cognitive services. So cognitive services are a suite of pre-trained AI models, you know, very powerful models that we've built and used for our internal services, much of that groundbreaking research showing up very quickly in the actual products within months. And so these suite of cognitive services across speech and language and other categories like that really can just plug directly into your application. And they combine really well with the bot framework. The bot framework makes it easy for you to very quickly create very powerful bots. So digging into those in turn, as we look at the cognitive services, we've thought about them in different categories. The set of speech services that we offer, the set of languages services that we offer, the set of vision, and then we surround that really with web search. But as you heard Satya and Scott say today, we're announcing a new category called the decision category. And really we want to help take it from just perceiving what's still going on in the world to really help making decisions. And the first service that we're really excited to talk about here is Personalizer. So Personalizer is a service that uh, really takes all the inputs. It's a reinforcement learning based system and it takes all the inputs of what your users are doing to really match them to the content that is, and the experience that is most relevant to them and what they're trying to do. And so Personalizer is, is really easy API for you to integrate with your systems. And we've been using it at scale with Xbox, you know, making millions of recommendations on it. And we're now announcing this is available in preview. Another service that we're excited to announce is Ink Recognizer. Really, you can bring the natural interfaces of pen and paper directly to your application where you can translate the text and the drawings directly into a digital form and really bring your applications to life that way. Across speech, uh, it really, if you saw Satya's keynote, there was a fantastic demo of the conversation language transcription uh, service where really you can have multiple, multiple people talking and transcribe it and really even the crosstalk of multiple people talking over that and really get a nice clean translation of a transcription of what the people are talking about. And those are the ones we want to highlight. We've really been making advances across a whole set of these services. We added an anomaly detector as a new service. We have neural text-to-speech, which creates really natural-sounding human voices. The Q&A maker has been updated to have much more you know, interactions and multi-turn conversations. A whole host of uh, new features coming out all across the board. And really, when you pull it all together, Azure Cognitive Services is the broadest set, the most comprehensive set of services that you can then use to go and build your applications. And let's go a little bit deeper on one of them. I talked about Personalizer. Let's talk a little bit about how exactly that works. So in Xbox, one of the things that we do often is the user gets to a home screen and we want to make a recommendation to them. Here's a new game that you might want to think about playing or a person you might want to connect to <coughs> excuse me, or an activity or something like that. And so we want to make recommendations on that. And so you start with all the things that we know about the user, the games that they've played, their achievements, their friends, even the time of day. And you make recommendations based on what you think you know about them. But doing it for one person is hard. You now have to scale it to every single user across Xbox. So if I'm a data scientist, I would start by going and gathering a data set and thinking through what are the features and training a model, and let's put it into production, and let's test it and see how well does this perform at making recommendations. And then I'd measure the results. And it probably the first version wouldn't work very well. And so I go back through and I iterate. I try some new features and some new data and try this again and again. And it's a very tiresome process. And one of the big changes that we have with Personalizer is using a different form of machine learning called reinforcement learning. And so here you start by simply defining the goal. I want to increase the user engagement, and here are the activities that we can recommend to a user. And you feed that into the Personalizer system, and then you take the same set of things that the user is doing, the same activities, and feed that into Personalizer. And then Personalizer is going to use that to make its own guesses, its own suggestions of what the user ought to try, and then measure the result and calculate a reward function based off of that. And it'll do this over and over with all the different users across the service. And so even if you don't have 
a data set, say a new game came out that I don't know how well it performs, Personalizer is going to learn from all these activities in this reinforcement loop of all the things that it can do and really make it scale across all of your users and all of your games so that each individual person is connecting with the content that's relevant to them at the time that it's relevant for them. And uh, you know, Xbox has been doing this for a while, and so you know, there are a lot of personalization systems out there. It's not like it's a new category. But by using a reinforcement learning approach, we think this is really different, and Xbox saw a 40% lift in user engagement from using this service. And so this is a service that we're excited to announce in preview, and we think it's gonna have a ton of applications all across you know, the, the industry's landscape. Another thing that we've done a lot with cognitive services is we've really helped customers take it from the cloud to the edge. And so you can take our set of cognitive services and deploy them in containers, which you can run on-prem, you can run it on an edge device, you can run it wherever you want to. And it's literally the exact same service, the exact same models wrapped up in a standard Docker container that you can take and deploy. And customers are telling us this is really differentiated in cases where they have disconnected service, like Carnival Cruise Line is not always connected, or other places where maybe the data is just too sensitive to share and send to the cloud. And so we announced this uh, in December of this past year, and today we're announcing that we have new services in containers, the anomaly detector, and then our speech-to-text and text-to-speech services. And this is the direction you can expect us to look to continue to head in with our cognitive services to really make it easy for people to take them wherever they need to. Additionally, on the bot services side of things, we really focus on two primary ways that we're thinking about them. One is we want to focus on using open source tools. And so we've had over 4,000 commits into the Microsoft bot framework from hundreds of developers. Most of those developers aren't even Microsoft employees, which really showcases we've got great community involvement on this project. And then on the other side, we want to make it really easy to deploy and manage these bots. And we see that by seeing we have 35,000 active bots and we're seeing 3,000 new bots show up each week, really showing that it's getting even easier to create and manage these services. But we're not stopping there. We have a bunch of new things coming there as well. We've got the Bot Framework 4.5 SDK, which adds adaptive dialogues, which makes it much easier to do multiple conversation, multiple turn conversations and, and sort of sub workflows within a conversation. As well, we talked about the open source virtual assistant solution accelerator, which really shows you how do you put a virtual assistant together. And now we have skills templates, making it even easier for you to add your skills to your virtual assistant as you're deploying it. And so it's great to talk about these different things that we're doing, things like the, the bot development framework, but to really pull it together, it's great to see it with a customer. And so we'll do that all throughout this, is look at what our customers are doing. And one of my favorite customers is La Liga. La Liga does, is the largest Premier League soccer team in, uh, in Spain. Uh, with some of the biggest soccer names in the world. And they've been using our cognitive services. And let's, let's watch this short video to see exactly how they're using them. La Liga is the brand that people love. We are very lucky to have fans, not customers. If we sum the followers in social media for clubs, players, and La Liga, we reach 1.6 billion. Our goals are to be the first choice of entertainment for the fans worldwide. We decided to partner Microsoft for technology, developing a huge digital ecosystem comprised by mobile apps, mobile games, websites, and digital assistant based on bots and artificial intelligence. Microsoft plays a key role. We are working with them as a data platform that help us gather all the information that we get from the fans in a unique place. We use Microsoft Bot Framework to do that. We use also Azure Bot Service to host the vault, and we use Azure Cognitive Services to understand what the fans want, especially the speech and language understanding. We want to have one global product that will cover different fans from different parts of the world. Being able to trigger what the fans want in the right moment is uh, the most important thing. We have been able to increase our social media followers by almost 30%. Technology is helping us to drive the brand near to the fans. This is key for our success and our growth. Microsoft has provided us the tools to improve our products and services for our fans. And so I want to, sh thank you. And I want to show you a little bit more about that. Uh, we really, we invited Lionel Messi to come and give this next demo, but apparently he was busy this weekend. So instead, we've got William Mendoza who's going to come and walk us through exactly the products that uh, La Liga is using. Will? 
<laughs> La Liga is the most followed sports league in the world. With over 1.6 billion fans, La Liga is consistently looking for new ways to interact with their fans. And they're doing just that with La Liga Virtual Assistant. The Assistant allows fans to experience La Liga across multiple platforms. Let me show you an example. So here I am in, mobile, I'm in my mobile here on Skype, and I, I'm greeted here with a menu of different things I can ask it. But in addition to touch, I can actually use natural language, natural language uh, my voice, because it's powered by language understanding. So let me show you an example. Did Barcelona win on Saturday? So much to my dismay, I noticed that they didn't win, but that's okay. I can look at the highlights to understand a little bit more and get some context on the match. I can also get statistics as well as player lineups. And the moment I see that the starting lineup really wasn't involved, I got a little bit more okay with it. <laughs> now, you notice that I used English, but that's okay too because natural language processing is also available in Spanish through language understanding models. So let me show you an example. ¿Cuándo es el próximo partido de Sevilla? So I've asked it when is Sevilla's next match, a different team, and they're playing Atletico on uh, the 12th of May. But what's also interesting is that not only does it recommend where I can watch the match, but it also tells me that they played before earlier in the season. So now I'm gonna ask about that and I can get highlights and other things. So now I could have gotten all this information through standard web search, but what's interesting here is through one place, I got one consistent experience. Now La Liga is a global brand and so they're looking to be wherever their, their users are. And so in addition to this, this same bot was deployed as a skill on Google Assistant. Let me show you that experience. Talk to La Liga. And so I've asked Google Assistant to talk to La Liga and it's bringing that skill in to this chat. So I'll ask it, who's the best player in the league? So this could be a controversial take, but most people will probably assume that it's a specific player. And you're probably right. However, what's interesting here is there's a nuanced answer. And this answer is actually essentially uh, they consider both goal scorers as well as goalkeepers. And so they take into account statistics and you can see with 0.72 goals per match, Oblak is actually another recommended player to investigate. So now I've showed you how this application works. Let me show you with reference architecture how it was built. So you can see here the, bot, the assistant was built with Microsoft Bot Framework. It's an open source SDK available on GitHub as Eric mentioned, and you can get started today. Uh, additionally, with Azure Bot Service, you can host the bot in Azure and do a couple of things. One is you can integrate natively with some of those cognitive services here. That, you know, I mentioned language understanding, but an interesting scenario is content moderator. So if I were to use profanity, the bot can give me a yellow card. Uh, <laughs> additionally, you can also natively uh, integrate with the, with the majority of these channels here. And so you notice I mentioned Google Assistant and some others uh, down the pike. Um, so thank you very much, and Eric, thanks. Thanks, Will. Uh, and next up, I'd like to invite someone from, uh, who works at La Liga, who I think has probably the most amazing job out there, the Director of Innovation working with La Liga. So Minerva, if you could please join me. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Eric. So uh, welcome, and uh, yeah, why don't you tell, I mean, you sound like you have an amazing job. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, <laughs> Um, in fact, I am the director of innovation in La Liga. Uh, at La Liga, we are constantly thinking about how technology can help us uh, to develop new ways to live uh, football for our fans. And now we are focused basically on fan knowledge with the help of the Digital Sport platform and the analytics platform that we are developing with Microsoft. Uh, and also we are focused on fan engagement. We are developing mixed reality and virtual reality content and also applying artificial intelligence for better um, fun knowledge and, and to improve our business decision making process. That sounds great. And, and then of course, Will walked us through, um, you know, sort of the assistant. Tell us a little bit more about how, uh, you know, Azure Machine, Azure uh, AI really helped you with that. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, as you could see in the, in the demo uh, before, we, not it's a trend of uh, people globally uh, using voice uh, enabled devices and assistants to communicate with different brands. So to support our mission, uh, our story, to be top of mind of our fans and to be the first choice for entertainment for them, we developed La Liga virtual system based on the Azure uh, and Cognitive Service uh, from Microsoft. 
um, fans can interact with the assistant, um, asking in different channels, in Skype and also in Google Assistant, um, asking um, results for the matches, uh, like standing statistics for the players, and also viewing um, video highlights. We develop the bot engine in uh, Microsoft Bot Framework. Um, then we were able to introduce uh, Azure Bot services to host the, the bot, but also to scale it. Uh, it was very compelling to create a, a digital uh, bot uh, capable to, to release it uh, globally. And we are planning to deploy this uh, bot in different uh, channels soon because the platform support uh, up to 11 uh, different platforms. We also are using um, um, Microsoft Language Understanding Service, Azure Language Understanding, uh, to solve uh, some things like mm, the term, for example, goal, goalkeeper have different assumptions and different um, 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 ways to say in depending on the, on the uh, Spanish speaking uh, region. So we are using language understanding to solve these kind of things. That's perfect, great. Um, and then Tell us about, you know, you, you do this to help try and connect with your fans. What's the impact this done? How has this worked for you? Uh, well, uh, La Liga has uh, a lot of uh, fans uh, globally. Um, 14 uh, million people attend these uh, La Liga stadiums last season. And also 2.7 billion people watch La Liga matches on, on TV. But also, uh, when we think of fans, we think of uh, all those people that engage with our product through digital channels. Uh, also, we have uh, 74 million people uh, following in our uh, social channels. And we are uh, increase our fan base in 30% in the last years. And we hope to continue growing. And this kind of platform, uh, multi-platform uh, capabilities, uh, help us with this, with the goals. That's great. Well, I really look forward to continuing to work with you, and, and maybe next year I can become one of those 14 million fans that attends in person at a game. But uh, thank you very much for coming. Yes, Thanks sir. for sharing with us. So we talked about apps and agents, the cognitive services, and the bot framework. And, and now I want to talk about knowledge mining, the, the next solution area. When we think about knowledge mining, the, what we're really trying to solve is these customers have all this data locked in all of these different formats, in PDFs and JPEGs and invoices that get scanned in and all these different things, and they can't unlock the value in it. And so what we do with knowledge mining is we take that data and we ingest it into the cloud, and then we run those same sets of cognitive services that we just talked about. We run OCR against it, the entity extraction, the key phrases, the key locations, and pull all that together into a graph. And we build this graph that annotates all the different documents that the users have. And then we take that graph and we make it available in Azure Search. And so we call this process cognitive search. And so we're happy to announce that this is now generally available, and the new generally available version of this is 30 times faster than the version that we had in preview. And so really excited about the capability that you can do with this. And uh, you know, this, the, one of the great things about this area is that not only does it work with documents, it works with all kinds of different media. And one of the most interesting ones to talk about is the work that we've done with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, the Met. And so uh, let's watch a video seeing what the Met has been doing with, uh, with Cognitive Search. The Met is not just a place that you visit, but it's really a great service to an audience all around the world. The Met receives 7 million visitors through its doors annually. However, we're interested in reaching the 3.9 billion internet-connected people all around the globe. The Met's Open Access Collection seeks to make the collection the most accessible, discoverable, and useful on the internet. There's a lot that goes into creating a work of art. There's information about the artist. What was the artist inspired by? Why was an object created? So all that information, all that data about an artwork really helps you to get a fuller picture about why it was made. Our collection spans 5,000 years. We have art from every culture. So just the sheer size of our collection makes it difficult to work with. Subject keyword tags enable us to find connections and patterns across eras, across artistic movements. Now we're doing work with AI projects like using tags with cognitive search. Now that we can leverage cognitive search, we'll be able to tag the whole collection at a much quicker pace. 
It's been very exciting to see visually similar artworks and hack prediction. Through AI, we can see things that we didn't have the possibility to see with our naked eye. There are patterns, there's information that are discoverable connecting art from one piece to the other. We're really able to understand things that we couldn't possibly have dreamed of. And so to look a little bit closer at this, I'd like to invite Kate up to give us a demo of, his, of some of the things that we just talked about. Kate? Hi, everyone. So I'm going to walk you through what we've been working on with the Met, um, and it's called the Art Explorer. So I was actually at uh, the filming for the video you just watched right there, and I really love the painting of Washington Crossing in Delaware. And I was in New York then, but I want to take a closer look at it now. So I have the art detail page for Washington Crossing in Delaware on the Art Explorer. And one of the core challenges when you're exploring art, especially in its digital form, is the fact that this is unstructured content. These are JPEG files of extremely intricate and sophisticated pieces of work that have a lot going on that's not explicitly written down anywhere. So that's why we've applied vision APIs like object detection that are identifying what's going on in this image and ge generating additional tags that you see here on the right, making it searchable based off of those parameters. And some of these, like war and army, are actually quite abstract concepts when you think about it. So this is helping me navigate all of this content by what I'm visually looking for. But once I've landed on one piece, I might want to explore other dimensions as well. And I can do that if I scroll down to this network graph view that you see here. And this is serving up other things in the index, like the time period and the medium, giving me a bit of a left to right view of other things that might interest me. So I'm going to try jumping to something that's of the same time period. And it turns out to be another image of George Washington, but it's a sculpture this time. What I want to draw your attention to, though, is a visually similar art panel that you see here on each page. This is identifying other similar pieces across the collection based off of vision algorithms that are studying the overall pattern and composition of this image. It has nothing actually to do with the object tags, the titles, or anything along those lines. So it's quite interesting that just with that, it's able to pull up other items that happen to be marble busts. And let's just try looking at one of them here. So this piece in particular is made by an artist named Edmonia Lewis. And we have that core bit of information from the Met's metadata. But what we're able to do is enrich it further with this panel here, bringing in our knowledge of the world with Thing Web APIs to generate a description from Wikipedia. So now I'm able to see that Mary Edmonia Lewis actually was the first African American and Native American woman to gain recognition in the art community as a sculptor. And that's quite an interesting insight that I personally, not as an art expert, I'm not sure if I would have come across this myself. So Cognitive Search is generating all this new knowledge, not on this one piece, but at scale across the hundreds of thousands of pieces that are in the Met's open access collection. And that's what's creating all these different insights and patterns and relationships between pieces that didn't, ex uh, d didn't exist before. And that's really enabling a great user experience. And that's really important because you don't really know what's going to inspire you until you're actually able to see it. Um, and my inspiration first started me with a painting of American hero, but AI landed me here on a sculpture that was made 200, uh, 100 years later by someone else who turns out to be an American pioneer. So I hope this is giving you an idea of what's possible if you're able to deeply understand your content at scale with something like Cognitive Search. And for reference, this is how the Art Explorer was built. It was using Azure Search to first ingest the Met's open access collection, which is a series of images and metadata, and then enrich it using the Cognitive Search capability within Azure Search. This is creating a search index that's then explorable via Azure Web Apps. Thank you, and back to you, Eric. So another request that we get all the time from our users is, hey, this Azure Search capability sounds really great, but what I really want to do is use that data set that you created for applications outside of Search. And so what we're now happy to announce is a new capability within Search where you can bring this knowledge store into an Azure store and get it in tabular or in JSON form, the exact sort of things that we, and that we extracted, the annotations. And then you can come up with new scenarios around them. You could take them into Power BI to sort of do new dashboards on them or to make predictions with Azure Machine Learning or, or otherwise bring them into your application. And so to show you a little bit more about how this works, I'd like to invite Brian up on stage to show us how we can use this knowledge store. Brian? Thanks, Eric. One of the cornerstones of our knowledge mining capabilities in Azure is the cognitive search capabilities of Azure Search. 
Kate just showed you the incredible power of Cognitive Search in the Met demo, so I want to show you the next chapter of knowledge mining using Cognitive Search. Today, about half of our Cognitive Search customers have completely unstructured data in the form of Office documents like Word and PDF. The other half actually have a mixture of both structured and unstructured data in things like SQL, Cosmos, or even CSV files. And what's cool about Cognitive Search is no matter what type of content you have, it actually just works the same. So for this demo, I'm actually going to use this CSV file, which contains a mixture of both structured data over here on the left, as well as unstructured data here in this improved field, which is actually customer feedback about Microsoft customers' experience with our support teams. So now that Cognitive Search can unlock scenarios like analytics, I want to show you how powerful and easy it is to use AI to turn something that looks like this into a full analytics experience inside of Power BI. To get started, you just go into the Azure Search portal and you select Import Data. Now, Azure Search supports almost all major uh, data sources inside of Azure uh, and file formats. In this case, I've actually already uploaded the Microsoft feedback, so let's go ahead and add Cognitive Search to that. Now, you might have noticed this notification up here. In the background, it's detecting the schema so that it can actually suggest enrichments and an index shape for me. So the first thing we need to do is attach our Cognitive Services, or we can keep it free if we're just trying it out. Next, we need to add enrichments. Now, because I have a mixture of structured and unstructured data, I actually want to go off and select this improve field, which contained that feedback. For enrichment granularity level, I'm actually going to select sentences because I want the finest grain level of detail on these enrichments. Now, when I check this box, all of these entities and key phrases, language and sentiment, will be extracted across all the sentences in all of the feedback that I selected. But this is actually just the basic experience. There's more skills and extensibility that you as developers can tap into, and you can learn about that right here from the portal. Now, if I stopped here, what this would produce is a cognitive search index that you could use to build uh, an experience like you just saw with the Met demo. But as Eric mentioned, our customers are asking us to do more with these AI enrichments. They have more scenarios that go beyond search. So to enable those scenarios, like analytics or machine learning, or even consuming them in your own application, you can now save enrichments to a knowledge store. This allows you to attach an Azure storage account and project these AI enrichments into blobs and tables in new hierarchical and relational shapes. In the case of table projections, we'll use a default shape that will produce four tables and contain all of the enrichments and create relationships. In the case of blob projections, we'll produce one JSON file per document that will contain all of the, these enrichments. Now, I've actually already run all of this content through Cognitive Search, so let's take a look at this content the, in generated in tables using Power BI. So Azure tables are not a relational data source like SQL. So when Cognitive Search projects data into tables, we actually dynamically build relationship IDs so that things like Power BI can understand them. Here you can see reviews have collections of key phrases, they also have collections of sentences and entities, and they have all of the enrichments sprinkled across all of that content. Now I can build an Azure, uh, an Azure Power BI dashboard off of that data, and you'll immediately see we can do aggregations of the people, the locations, the specific sentences extracted. In this center table right here, you'll see that we can visualize the average of review sentiment by month and by language, which highlights an important insight right here on this blue line, which is actually that we need to improve the performance of our customer feedback support in German. But I, I didn't even know that this file had multiple languages in it until I ran Cognitive Search, so there's no way I'm getting that insight without that natural language. Now, when you combine these AI enrichments with Power BI's natural language capabilities, you can ask really powerful questions, like show me the counter reviews by product and sentiment polarity. And what this really shows is the power of AI across the entire Microsoft stack to enable you to understand your data. Now, I've just shown you one simple analytic scenario, but the new knowledge mining capabilities of Cognitive Search can unlock any scenario that requires your data to be transformed into structured knowledge. So go get started with Cognitive Search today. Thank you. So another area that we hear that companies have a lot of documents in is forms. And so, you know, you think about every place that you go that you fill out some form, be it the dentist office, be it invoices, be it receipts that you have. And so how do you take all these forms and get the digital information out of them? And so today we're happy to announce Form Recognizer, a service where you can start with basically any type of form and quickly extract the information from it in a tabular or JSON structured form. 
And so to just sort of walk through a little bit more of how this works, we've worked with Chevron on their invoices. And so Chevron needs to give us a set of at least five invoices that then we'll take and sort of learn, hey, how is this form structured and what is the different information in it? And then we can extract it out in a tabular form or in JSON to really pull this data out so they can then take it wherever they need to take it and deploy it into their forms. And so we have thousands of companies that we talk to that have so much data locked up in forms like this. Uh, and one place that we've been working with uh, is with uh, Financial Fabric and, and their customer, Starbucks, where they have to, a whole bunch of data that they're processing around there in their treasury department. So I'd like to invite Morgan and uh, Subra on stage to come talk to me about that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, why don't you guys tell us a little about yourselves? What, what, what exactly do you do? Sure thing. So, Morgan Collins, Starbucks. Uh, I work on the treasury side, typically in investments, but as a business user, I actually work with data quite a bit. So, no real coding knowledge. Don't ask me to code a darn thing, but uh, still like to work with data when possible. Thank you, Eric. I'm Subra Bose, CEO of Financial Fabric. We are a New York City fintech, provide data hub services to the $74 trillion investment management industry. Our clients receive tens of thousands of PDF documents from where we have to extract data and empower business users like Morgan. And so why don't you guys tell me a little bit about how you've been using Form Recognizer? Sure, so uh, being in the dirty world of business users, uh, we deal with a ton of unstructured or semi-structured data all the time. And, and frankly, data is kind of trapped there. Uh, every quarter, a member of my team would look at two forms, two PDFs side by side, and visually reconcile to see if there were any differences. And that's difficult, manual Sounds terrible. work. Yeah, it, it's, it's not great. And so Form Recognizer and, and tools like that have really helped us unlock a lot of process improvement and have helped save us a ton of time. Mm. So earlier, we used to write code, ETL code, for every one of these PDF form types which would take a few weeks of development time. With Form Recognizer, it's very simple. We provide five document of the same type and then let the engine learn and extract data as JSON from there. So our setup time for a new form is now a few minutes of data science activity as opposed to a few weeks of ETL development, which no one wants to do, by the way. So that is 90% productivity gain to go from document to insight. It sounds fantastic. And so, I mean, this must be impacting the, the way that you guys work then. Tell me a little bit more about that. Absolutely. I mean, as a business user uh, with zero coding skills, I wouldn't be able to take this data out myself. And not having to go through a tech queue and to beg and plead and hustle a bunch of developers to actually write that ETL code, um, I'm able to actually get insight from these documents and be able to run that analysis and do some improved comparisons too. I mentioned how it was an extremely manual and iterative process. Well, now we can actually systematize how we review data between periods and automate that and improve our own controls. So Form Recognizer gave us a way to go from document to insight without writing any ETL code, practically zero ETL code. So back in a few years ago, when I was CTO for Credit Suisse Asset Management, we had 50 ETL developers whose job was to write code to extract data from documents. At Financial Fabric, we have zero. Every morning, business users spend four to five hours, which is 60% of their time, to get data from different documents, copying and pasting all different forms. We have reduced that to zero. We empowered users like Morgan to focus more on insight and analytics of the actual data as opposed to getting the data. We believe Form Recognizer is a revolutionary technology in the Azure AI stack, which is gonna change data and how insight is derived from document in the business world. That's really exciting. Well, thank you both. Really appreciate working with both of you and looking forward to all the great future collaborations we'll have. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Eric, for having us here. Okay, so we've now talked through two of our solution areas. Let's dig into the third one, which is the machine learning area. 
And so at Azure, of course, we have the full stack of everything that you need from machine learning, from the pre-trained models that we've talked about to all the different tools you can use, the frameworks, the productive services, and the infrastructure to really make it all come together. But I want to spend a little bit more time digging into the Azure Machine Learning Service itself. When we think about the Azure Machine Learning Service, there are three areas that we really focus on. The simplify, how we can, we can simplify machine learning for developers, as well as the end-to-end -end life cycle management and how we can make that easier for people as well. And we do all of this on this foundation of our commitment to being an open platform. So let's talk a little bit more about each of these. Let's talk about how we are simplifying machine learning. We've announced three things this past, you know, as a part of this, uh, this build announcement um, about how we're simplifying machine learning. A year ago, we announced automated machine learning. This is a capability where the machine learning will go and create the model for you, going through all the iterations that a data scientist would do. Well, now we've added a UX on top of it, a UI on top of it, making it even easier. So there's literally no code to write. You merely take your data, upload it into the uh, automated machine learning UI, say, this is what I want to optimize for, and it goes and produces a model for you that go uh, against that. Me really making it simple for people of all skill levels to go and create AI models for their particular business needs. The next thing that we've done is we've taken the, uh, the Azure Machine Learning Service and added a visual interface to it. And so now in a drag and drop manner, you can sort of string the different components of your pipelines and your different workflow together. And so in AI, there's a lot of pipelines, step one, step two, and how the data flows together. And having a visual experience to see how all of this connects makes it much simpler for developers, be they, you know, again, skilled developers who are very experienced in, this, in data science, or people who are much newer to it and are much happier to sort of have a drag and drop and visual interface for it. And the third thing that we're announcing is that you can now, from your Azure Machine Learning workspace, take the work that you've already got in there and directly go to a Jupyter Notebook. And so you can spawn a notebook. This is the, probably the most popular format for data scientists to manage and edit and, and develop their work in. And you can do this directly from the workspace, connected it directly to the data and the models that you already have in there. So we're really focused on the things that we can do to make AI simpler and machine learning simpler across the board, regardless of your skill level or the tools you're using or how you want to work. The other thing that we've been spending a lot of time focusing on is this end-to-end -end life cycle management. And so most people have heard of this concept of DevOps, how developers are constantly deploying and constantly uh, you know, managing their code. Well, in ML, there's a different concept around ML ops, because the things that you do are slightly different. It feels the same, but it's not. Uh, what do I check into source control? Is it the model? Is it the data? How does all that come together? How do I collaborate with the data scientists and the developers, um, who often are very different personas? And so what we've done is we've taken what looks like a fairly standard DevOps workflow, but let's walk through how a data scientist would plug into this. The first stage is collaboration. Virtually every environment, every company out there uses Git to store their company's code, and the developers will use Git. And so now Azure Machine Learning is going to directly integrate with your Git environment to bring your models, your data, and all of the environment that you need around that in Git and make it easier for your data scientists to collaborate with your developers on that. Then I train the app, and now I need to validate it. I need to make sure this app, this model actually does what I think it should do. And so Azure Machine Learning has a profiling and a validation service to dramatically simplify that phase of it. Then the next thing I need to do is I need to deploy the model. And so again, Azure Machine Learning is going to help you package this in a standard Docker container, making it simple to deploy on the cloud, on-prem, or to the edge. And then I need to start monitoring this, because one thing that happens a lot is the data changes. What I trained on looks different than what my users are actually experiencing on a regular basis. And so I need to do to instrument the model, which Azure Machine Learning will do automatically for you, as well as I need to make sure that I'm analyzing it to see how is this changing over time. And then the other thing I may want to do is integrate it with Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps is already the leading place for people to do DevOps workflows and pipelines. And so now there's an extension for uh, Azure Machine Learning extension for DevOps, which plugs directly in and enables you to trigger workflow in Azure DevOps based on changes in your Azure Machine Learning model. And the last thing that comes with this is the audit trail. Often you need to say, hey, this model made a prediction seven months ago, and I need to understand why it did that, either for legal or for compliance reasons. And Azure Machine Learning is going to pull all that together and make it really simple for you to understand, hey, how, what was the state of the world when I put all this together? So really trying to embrace this end-to-end -end workflow of all the things I need to do when I'm building a machine learning model and dramatically simplify that. 
In addition to focusing on the ML ops side of things, we're also trying to help people with really accelerated hardware. We've been the only people to really focus on FPGAs to accelerate the inferencing and serving of their models. And so we're happy to announce now that FPGA model serving is generally available for the vision models that we've had in, in preview to date. And so now you can run you know, uh, transfer learn models faster than any other service out there and cheaper than any other service out there. So we bring the simplified machine learning and the end-to-end -end life cycle management, and it's all based on this concept of an open platform. And so we want to talk about some new integrations that we've done, new offerings in this space. So one is MLflow. Uh, MLflow is a API, an open source API, that really talks through how you manage your machine learning process, the workflow, all of the life cycle of it. Uh, and this is an open source API, and this is implemented directly in Azure Machine Learning. So you can call these exact APIs directly in Azure Machine Learning and get the service tracking and everything that you would expect, expect to come with that. The second is the Onyx runtime. Uh, Onyx is a, inner, a file format that makes it really easy to uh, exchange models from, say, TensorFlow to PyTorch to other different formats that you may want, and it runs really, really fast. And so what we've done with this is we've focused on telling a developer, you just need to focus on running it in the Onyx runtime, and you're going to get the hardware acceleration for free. And so in the Onyx runtime, which is an open source package and you can take and deploy anywhere, we've now integrated uh, NVIDIA's Tensor RT libraries as well as Intel's NGraph libraries. So hardware acceleration is going to come directly from it, and you don't even have to think about which one do I want. You merely just you know, plug the system in and run with the Onyx runtime. And the third thing is Azure Open Data Sets. These are uh, a new capability that we're announcing. These are highly curated data sets uh, that are available to you in Azure that you can then join with your existing data to really simplify and, and augment your machine learning process. Um, you know, data sets the, of, of different things to really expand and, and really flush out how all of the data could come fit together. And so all of these different things that we're announcing in Azure Machine Learning, there's a whole lot to talk about. Um, but to really show it, again, it's easier to see with a demo. And so we've been working with Walgreens Boots Alliance. And so uh, they've been, they have all these different categories you know, in their stores, from you know, beauty to uh, fitness to all their different products. And they want to understand how they can build marketing campaigns to target all their different users. And so I'd like to in invite uh, Sonal and Shivani on stage to walk us through how that can work. Thank you, Eric. So Walgreens Boots is a health and beauty retailer and pharmacy chain in the United Kingdom. This is their marketing campaign dashboard. As you can see, they have nearly 2,500 stores and a large customer loyalty program that serves up targeted offers to shoppers in order to drive up purchasing. Let's see how Boots leverages Azure Machine Learning to scale their model and model deployments. As a developer that's new to machine learning, I'm always on the lookout to simplify and streamline model creation, because this is usually a pretty tedious and iterative process. It's no wonder that so many of these campaign models still need to be built. Now, there has to be a way to simplify this. There is. Let's go over to the Azure portal. Here I am in the dashboard, and I'm going to show you quickly how automated machine learning can simplify this process by building lots of models in parallel, and then intelligently selecting the right models at the right time, and then tweaking hyperparameters appropriately in order to get to the optimal outcome. Let's see this in action right away in Azure Machine Learning. I'm now in the new automated machine learning user experience. And you'll see that it's relatively easy to set up an experiment quickly. In just a matter of few clicks, I'm going to set up my category-based propensity model. I'll select the target compute, which will auto-scale on the fly to meet my experiment's needs. It will also automatically connect to the storage accounts associated with my subscription. I can also pull files from my local drive on the fly. In this case, I'm going to go for the CSV file because it has the information about the fitness and nutrition category of products that I'm interested in making some predictions on. And you'll see here that automated machine learning has sampled the data set so that I can easily review and explore it. I can include or exclude columns that I want the model to consider. And I can also profile the data and see some summary statistics. So what do you think this data is going to tell us? 
I think that age is going to have a big role in the purchasing affinity for the fitness and nutrition category of products. But let's see if this is actually the case. Let me finish setting up my experiment. I'm going to set this up as a classification task because I want to understand if customers will or won't purchase in this category of products. I'm also going to select the fitness and nutrition column so that I can quickly get my experiment started. Now with the press of a button, automated machine learning is going to select the runs from millions of possibilities that show promise so that instead of weeks or days, I'm going to now have my model in minutes. In fact, let's take a look at a run that just completed a little bit earlier. You'll see here that automated machine learning has picked out the models that have the highest accuracy at the top of this graph. I can also drill in a little bit into a specific iteration so that I can see some key metrics associated with this run and decide if this model is right or not for me. And I did all of this without writing a single line of code. But for all of you data scientists and developers in the audience that prefer a code-first experience, you can also use automated machine learning in your favorite notebooks or IDEs. So here you'll see that notebooks are now fully integrated into the authoring experience for Azure Machine Learning. Let's get our notebook running. I'm going to switch to this notebook that I just ran a little bit earlier to show you that I can do everything in the notebook that I just showed you in the automated machine learning UX. I can set up my automated task. I can see iterations. And I have also enabled model explainability. Now, this is important because it gives me transparency into how the model was built and what features influenced the prediction. And you can see here that while age was a big factor in the purchase affinity, there were other features like the number of categories purchased, gender, et cetera, that played a much bigger role. This is the power of a data-centric business. My model is now ready. Let's see what it takes to put this into production. And for that, I'm going to call on my DevOps engineer. Great, thank you. All right. So for organizations like Boots, the model creation process is just one part of the challenge. We need to update these models to reflect the data changes and customer preferences and trends. So we really need to scale out this model creation process for the hundreds of categories and thousands of stores that Boots has. So what we can do here is leverage Azure Machine Learning Pipelines. So what I'll do is basically take the experiment that Sonal created and turn it into a reproducible format. What I'm doing here is running a for loop through each of the categories. So I'm taking in data relative to that category, training and outputting a model. So at the end of this for loop, I'll basically have an optimized model for each of the categories that Boots has. That's great, but how do you put this and operationalize it? So, as a DevOps engineer, my role here is to quickly package the model, test it in an environment, and then deploy it out into production so I have the most updated model running. So what we can do here is leverage the power of Azure DevOps and Azure Machine Learning to automate and accelerate this process. So here is my Azure DevOps project. So what this basically does is help me collaborate, manage the development and deployment of my software application. What I've done in the background here is import all my code, uh, which is my training, testing, and deployment scripts from my GitHub repo. And I've also installed my new machine learning extension to help me run some of these machine learning tasks. So first, I'm going to start creating my pipelines. Here is my build pipeline. It's a continuous integration pipeline where I'm automating the process of training and registering my model. So at the end of this stage, I will register my optimized model for all these categories in Azure Machine Learning Portal. So here I can see where this model is going to be deployed out at later in this pipeline. It's great, I have this model, I've registered it. Now at the end of this pipeline, it'll trigger this release pipeline, which is basically automating my deployment process. So for example, every time I have a new version of this category one model, it'll trigger a deployment process where I'm packaging the model into a Docker container and then running it in my test environment. So what sort of quality gates do you have in place right here? Great question. So what I'm doing here in my test environment is taking that container and running it on an Azure container instance, and then I'm running my model against some test input data to make sure that it's functioning as expected. 
Now, if it passes this quality gate, the deployment pipeline will continue, and I'm going to deploy that same container out into production. Now, this is really great because every time I have data change or I'm updating my training scripts, all I have to do is a final code commit, which will then trigger these pipelines. So I'll register a new model and then get it out into production as quickly as possible. So what's also really great about integrating Azure Machine Learning here is that I have visibility into all of the artifacts and assets I created throughout this pipeline. So I have my experiments, my models, as well as all the deployments that I just created in ACI and AKS. So now I have visibility from the experimentation process all the way out to our deployment process. So let's take a look at the reference architecture to get a final overview. So in summary, basically what Azure DevOps does, it lays down this framework to turn your machine learning scenario into a CI CD process. Azure Machine Learning then helps you manage and track all these artifacts that you're creating as well as accelerate each stage of your machine learning model life cycle. And you also saw how automated machine learning makes it so much easier to build models faster and how with model explainability, you get transparency into the model so that machine learning is no longer a black box. Exactly. By leveraging the power of Azure Machine Learning and Azure DevOps, it's never been easier to take your model into production. Over Thank to you. you, Eric. Thank you both. That was great. I mean, it's really powerful to, talk, to think about how you can just sort of script a whole bunch of different model creation using automated machine learning with Azure Machine Learning pipelines to wrap it around it. But don't just take my word for it. I'd like to invite Dan from Walgreens Boots to come and tell us a little bit about how they've been using that in their business. Dan? Hi. Hey, so uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, what you do at Walgreens Boots. Sure, I'm Dan Humble. I'm the Chief Data Analytics Officer for Walgreens Boots. So I look after all the data scientists and the folks who look after the uh, data integrity for us. And so, I mean, we just saw the demo of how uh, Azure Machine Learning has been you know, working with you guys. Tell us a little bit more about how you've used it. Sure, so uh, as you saw on the demo, uh, we've used it in our Boots business, which is the UK portion of our business, to drive offers uh, directly to our customers. So these are personalized offers, the kinds of things that you receive through email, or through app, uh, or even through traditional um, routes like mail. Uh, we are starting to use it in various other aspects of our business and also bringing it to drive offers in the United States through Walgreens as well. And so how is the, the tool set really helping accelerate your development? So the, the, the really interesting uh, thing that I found was when we first started the journey with machine learning, I was expecting it to improve uh, the offers and the performance of our offers um, somewhat, you know, maybe by about 20 or 30 percent. Um, but what we found is a much more dramatic acceleration of our uh, return on investment. Uh, so in some cases, the models improved by some more like 200 or 300 percent, particularly um, for more prestige beauty brands and, and things like that, um, which was gr as great interest to us and also to our, our supplier base as well. And a lot of this, too, is focused on trying to help make your developers more productive. How has that worked out for you? Uh, that's been amazing. So the, um, what we found is that the, you know, some of the simple things, like you saw in the demo, so the ability to share notebooks and that kind of stuff uh, has, has meant that the, the data scientists are able to more work much more productively. We've also used AutoML uh, to, to build models out. So what we'll do is build a model for one category. So we'll build it for something like uh, the Benefit brand or the Clinique brand, and then we can use also ML to generate those offers for other brands that look very similar. When we've, when we've tried to use it to sort of build a model from scratch, it performs pretty well, almost as well as if a human built it, but where we found it's quite powerful is in replicating out across different categories or new brands where there's something already in place to build upon. Well, that sounds great. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us, and uh, we really look forward to continuing working with you. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. So those are our three solution areas. You pull them all together, and it really makes Azure AI the best place to build and do AI across any different place. Uh, and we've really looked to prove this out with our customers that we've talked about. Um, but there's one more customer I want to talk about. Um, it's a little known fact. If I hadn't gone into computer science, I probably would have gone into particle physics, but I'm not sure I was bright enough for it. Uh, but we've been working with Fermilab, and so let's see a video of some of the things that they've been doing as they try and push the envelopes of science and how Azure Machine Learning is helping them.
What is the origin of our universe? Researchers at the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest particle accelerator, are trying to understand why anything in our universe, every bit of matter, exists at all. The LHC smashes protons together as they travel a 17-mile loop at close to the speed of light, producing more than 500 terabytes of data every second. Researchers then need to filter that raw data in real time to isolate the most interesting events. Scientists at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, CERN, MIT, the University of Washington, and other collaborators, working together with Microsoft, have prototyped their data analysis problem on Azure Machine Learning and demonstrated significant gains in speed. With the ability to accelerate the building and training of sophisticated models, Azure Machine Learning has the scope to handle the LHC's zettabyte-sized data challenge. Soon, it may help researchers identify the handful of collisions among millions that might give insight into the moments after the Big Bang. So it sounds amazing, but I'd like to invite Nan out, who's an actual particle physicist, to tell us a little bit more about that. Nan? Thank you very much. So uh, computer science classes are a little too easy for you, as I did some a little bit more. Uh, so yes, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Right. So I'm a particle physicist. I, uh, I work at Fermilab, which is uh, the US's primary particle physics laboratory. Um, and I'm a collaborator on the compact muon solenoid experiment, uh, which is at the uh, CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider, which is the uh, world's highest energy particle collider. And so, I mean, you guys are really pushing the envelopes of science. Like, what are some of the things that you guys are, are exploring with this? Right, so, I mean, we, we try to use the LHC to really understand fundamental questions about nature. So, um, we uh, discovered the Higgs boson in, in 2012, and so the things that I'm interested in are sort of using the Higgs to really understand some of these, these mysteries that are still outstanding. Uh, so, for example, dark matter. So, dark matter is, is all around us. It makes up 80% of the matter in the universe, and we don't know that much about it. Um, and so I want to understand if maybe the Higgs is somehow a portal to this dark sector, if it's this, this thing that, you know, it lets the dark matter talk to the regular matter. Another one is uh, uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So there was some, something in the early universe um, that created some asymmetry between matter and antimatter, or else it would all have just annihilated and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. So. All pretty glad that didn't happen. Right. Um, so, you know, tell us about how you're using machine learning and Azure machine learning in this. Right. So. Um, so, uh, actually, LHC scientists have been using machine learning for a while now, but we really wanted to sort of capitalize on this, on this boom. Um, and so we use it from things like automatizing uh, the way we operate the experiments to filtering this data and also what you heard about uh, in the video, which is accelerating our computing because we have sort of huge uh, amounts of data. Um, and so just as an example, um, so we, we collide particles every uh, 40 million times a second. We get thousands of particles, hundreds of thousands of, of detector signals uh, every 25 nanoseconds, and we want to filter that data. Uh, and so we have machine learning algorithms which are really trying to isolate, for example, the Higgs signal. Um, and the better we can isolate it, the more precisely we can understand um, sort of its properties and how it relates to some of these fundamental questions. Well, it's uh, super interesting and, uh, yeah, really hope you help understand why there's stuff and not not stuff, and uh, that'll exactly. help us all. So thank you very much with that. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So that concludes my talk. If you're going to take a picture of one slide, take a picture of this slide. We have a ton of other talks and sessions that we're giving as well. This GitHub link has links to more information about many of the things that we talked about, the demos, the different services as well. We have a huge section on the expo floor where you can go and learn more about all these different things. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I look forward to working more with you on Azure AI. Thank you.